So I'm delighted to welcome everyone to this exciting event. Um, uh, the title of the presentation today is Fountain House, A Working Community That Brings Hope to Mind. And it will be a three-way pre presentation uh, by John Rivera, who's a member at Fountain House, uh, Alan Doyle, who's the Director of Training and Education uh, at Fountain House, uh, and our very own Fang Pei Chen, who's an assistant professor here and who has worked very closely in a very interesting project with folks at Fountain House. So, um, and I would like to introduce everybody and then thank the people who contributed to this event. Um, so um, I'm going to read because I don't want to miss anything in terms of your introduction. Uh, so John Rivera uh, joined Fountain House in 1996. He holds a BA in uh, Public Administration from John Jay College of Criminal Justice and currently he's a part-time resident counselor. Um, at Fountain House, he's a member of the Wellness Unit and a volunteer men mentor for what's referred to as the Unity Project, which outreaches to youth and young adults dealing with mental health issues. John's also an advocate for mental health recovery. Recently, he joined Alan and others in a panel at the 21st World Congress of Social Psychiatry in Lisbon, Portugal, uh, to present the Fountain House Recovery Model and Integrated Care. Um, Alan Doyle uh, is the Director of Training and Education at Fountain House, where he oversees the, the, the Fountain House Institute, which is an international training forum for the working community approach to psychiatric recovery. It was originally developed at Fountain House and has since been replicated worldwide. This is really uh, significant. Uh, previously, he was the Assistant Director for a regional vocational school in Long Island. Uh, providing occupational training to adults and high school students and literacy education to immigrants. Um, and while he was there, he created an alternative high school for disaffected youth. Um, he's served as the liaison of the Massachusetts State Commissioner, Commission to the state's congressional delegation in D.C., and he taught Latin in the Great Neck Public Schools. So you have... <laughs> Uh, he holds a doctorate in educational planning and, social, uh, and social policy from the Harvard University School of Education, and he's the co-author of this new book, Hot Off the Press, uh, Fountain House, Creating Community in Mental Health Practice, uh, from the Columbia University Press in November 2013. Uh, and Fang Pei Chen is an assistant professor at CSSW and a faculty member in our AGPP curriculum. Uh, her research focuses on service delivery, implementation, and dissemination of community-based psychiatric rehab programs. She's interested in identifying elements of best practices in community mental health to enhance assist the system's capacity to collaborate with individuals and their informal support systems to mitigate the impact of mental health of mental illness, I'm sorry. <laughs> and um, again, Fang Pei has worked very closely with her collaborators at Fountain House, and that's the project they're going to present. Um, and then I would also like to thank the AGPP committee, the Student AGPP cau Caucus, uh, Anne McCann Oakley's department, the Communications Department, Student Services, for because it really takes a village to create a presentation like this. So. That was an eloquent introduction. I appreciate it very much. Both John and I uh, are very appreciative of the invitation to speak to you today about Fountain House. Uh, <clears throat> Ellen reminded me we were here three years ago. <laughs> and I was thinking to myself, gee, I wonder if I'm going to say the same thing. <laughs> Hope not. <clears throat> uh, but, and also I want to thank very much Fang Pei who invited us and felt it was important that we were able to talk about Fountain House to you today. Um, <clears throat> I was fully introduced. Uh, um, basically, I am an educator who now works in, as, in social work and um, <clears throat> have been doing this work for about the last 14 years now. So, uh, <clears throat> Most of you know about Fountain House as a place um, on West 47th Street in New York uh, that was started in 1948 by a group of ex-patients from Rockland State Hospital. 
Um, they were, it was also started by a woman by the name of Elizabeth Skirmahorn. And on the way over here, I mentioned to John that there's a Skirmahorn building. And so she was really part of this large family, uh, well-known family in New York City, of which there's a building on Fifth Avenue and I think 18th Street. And, and of course, in Brooklyn, you have the, the, the uh, subway stop, Skirmahorn Street. So, <clears throat> and she was very much in the tradition, I think, of the settlement house uh, workers and, and the way I think about her is she's really uh, created a settlement house for people with psychiatric illnesses by creating Fountain House. And she was the creator, one of the creators of Fountain House. Um, <clears throat> there's a, a thousand members at Fountain House, so there's a lot of relationships that are, go on at Fountain House of, of a variety of, a whole, whole bevy of relationships that are involved there. Um, <clears throat> we have residents for I think close to 500 people. I think we are the largest residential facility, psychiatric residential facility in the state, uh, oddly. Um, we have an art gallery, a farm. Um, as I was introduced, we have an international training institute. Uh, <clears throat> uh, we're currently doing innovations in social cooperatives and young adults, and John is on one of those innovations that we're dealing as a reach out program to individuals who are, are young and who are first experiencing their first psychotic break. Uh, <clears throat> and we have associates, among them are employers, and the, uh, some of you might be familiar with the TE program, the Transitional Empo uh, Employment Program. So we've always worked in partnership with other groups. This is not, a, we're not a lone ranger, we're not all alone, <laughs> but we've depended uh, significantly for others to, uh, to accomplish our, our goals. And finally, we have a vision, and that vision is about uh, <clears throat> recovery and social integration for our members. But today, I don't, really don't want to talk about the place. I want to talk about Fountain House as an idea. Uh, <clears throat> and um, I'll just tell you a little story of how this began about eight years ago. Um, you, you may know students who come to Fountain House as interns, and I recall this one intern from <clears throat> uh, New York University, and sh when she returned back from one of her classes, the professor said, well, what did you do today? <laughs> so this is sort of a low, if you know Fountain House, this is sort of a loaded question because, of course, she said, well, you know, I work in horticulture, and we were putting out flowers in each of the rooms, and and I'm sure she mentioned how she cleaned the bathroom at the end of the day with the member. And the professor was really incensed that, um, that she was spending her time this way. I mean, this was a, she was supposed to be educated as a professional, and um, he clearly saw this as a complete waste of time uh, for somebody of her level. And when she told me this story, and she was, <clears throat> uh, she told me about the incident in class. It was a rather public uh, display that went on. And when I thought about it, I said, you know, there's something wrong with this uh, dialogue that's occurring. And that um, <clears throat> I felt the professor missed something. Um, but I also felt that we weren't doing our job in helping people to understand exactly what it is that we do at Fountain House. <clears throat> and, um, Eventually, <laughs> took a while, uh, eventually I thought of it as a model, but I, at least initially I said, you know, it's probably the way we're talking about it. Because um, <clears throat> words and names are very important. They help us to sort of situate what we're looking at. And re I really believe personally that you don't see things that you don't have names for. Somehow you're looking at it, but if, if you don't have the name for it, you, don't, you, you really don't. Uh, take it in. So <clears throat> it started me really on a quest that resulted in the book uh, about, um, <clears throat> about um, first of all, to think of how we're going to conceive a fountain house as, as differently from, you know, just sort of um, putting out plants or caring for plants. And, and, and we came up with uh, the idea of community and a working community. It's also a professional practice 
which um, um, I call social uh, practice. And <clears throat> finally, it's a vision which has, um, as Ellen mentioned in the beginning, there's over 300 imitations of Fountain House throughout the world. And there's probably a lot more of varying degrees of people who claim to be part of a clubhouse or a fountain house. So, <clears throat> um, so but we didn't come to this language right away. <laughs> uh, historically, Fountain House really started with a group of members, and they started the WANA Society, the We Are Not Alone Society. <clears throat> it's a group of ex-patients who were formed with Elizabeth Skirmahorn, who I mentioned earlier. And they really thought of, the way they thought of uh, Fountain House was sort of as a social club. Um, I'm sure all of you are familiar with uh, uh, <clears throat> investigations that occur in uh, Little Italy, and uh, they're still after mafia, and these gentlemen are walking <laughs> and whispering to one another <laughs> in front of their social club. So, but these social clubs go back to the, um, <clears throat> the 30s, the 40s. You know, the part of the, it was all part of an immigrant population, and uh, the, these clubs became the way of integrating uh, the immigrant population. They promised housing, and certainly Juana promised housing, education, uh, companionship, employment. This was the type of thing that the <clears throat> the WANA group would go up to Rockland State and talk to other patients. When you leave, come see us. Uh, and it was essentially a peer-to-peer -peer model that they were, they were applying. Um, in 1955, John Beard enters the stage for Fountain House. Uh, <clears throat> he was the fourth executive director at Fountain House. Um, he came, um, and he, he actually worked there till his death in 1982. Um, prior to coming to Fountain House, he was working uh, outside of Detroit City in a hospital <clears throat> that was called Eloise. And there he became uh, enamored of uh, the work of a psychiatrist uh, who felt very, very uh, assuredly that, <clears throat> that there was something, uh, something really healthy and productive about people with mental illness, despite the fact of the, how they either acted or were, was, were able to, to behave in, or, or accomplish things within Eloise. <clears throat> and he introduced a therapeutic approach called activity group therapy, which um, they, uh, he and, <clears throat> and um, John Beard and also the psych psychologist that worked with them, whose name I just forgot, Victor Gertzel. The three of them, they were like a, a team. Um, there's a word for it in, in, uh, uh, <clears throat> in hospitals where you, you form sort of a medical team to go in and, and to work with a group of people rather than just an individual. So they, they felt very strongly that, um, <clears throat> that there was this healthy part of the person, and they really wanted to investigate uh, how they can address um, people's capacities for, for accomplishment rather than to study the illness. And they developed these norms or tenets. One was we have to get them to do normal things like uh, they would play, uh, play different games or they'd have... Uh, uh, plays, they would make popcorn together, they would paint. And, um, <clears throat> but in any case, it was essentially, when you think about it, it was basically a strength-based approach that they were taking. Um, they felt very strongly that they had to respect the individual's choice. Uh, they developed the uh, coaching role for, the, for staff in terms of how they would relate to patients. And finally, they felt there had to be some sort of um, movement towards the outside and social inclusion, and they formed the, the it, it's essentially, they formed the early uh, transitional employment. Um, <clears throat> and they really felt this was how a recovery system should work. Uh, Beard then came to Fountain House, and he simply applied these principles <clears throat> to what was a day program, and, they, and that's how he referred to it. <laughs> It's the day program. What do, you, what do you do during the day? You go to work, all right? 
So he sort of created a work day uh, as a day program <coughs> with social and uh, recreational activities in the evenings and on weekends. So he simply said, well, what's normal in society? It's normal to go to work five days a week from nine to five. That's what Fountain House will be. You come to work five days a week. And, <coughs> um, and essentially, when you look at you know, going to work or something, it's, a, it's really a task group methodology, which, is, which is, I feel is very rich in terms of uh, the applications that it offers to people with mental illness. First of all, it gives purpose right away. We're all we're, we're together. We have to do something. Whether it's we have to, <clears throat> uh, we have a hydroponics area now. We're growing our own food. So, well, you have to figure out well how do we do this. So the purpose becomes very clear. Um, <clears throat> there's different roles and responsibilities. And here again, when you start thinking about taking responsibility for a particular activity within a group. It's really what Bandura talks about as uh, an active experience. It is the most important um, component of somebody establishing their, the self, their feeling of self-efficacy and motivation. Um, there are structured relationships. Uh, there's modeling, which is, once again, a major uh, tenet of, of Bandura in, in building a person's a sense of self-efficacy. Uh, there's also a planning that goes on uh, within task groups so that you got start getting into issues around empowerment and shared leadership. And finally, there's learning <coughs> uh, that occurs. You all stop and say, how did we do today? Uh, you can all congratulate when we've, we, <laughs> the meal came out. There, was, there wasn't too much salt in the soup. You know, <laughs> We could feel good about this. Thank you, so-and-so, who made the soup. And all, you know, so you have that basic sense of a feedback loop, of learning from, your, learning from your intervention, seeing how you could do it better, congratulating each other if you've accomplished it. And that's what I mean about task group methodology. It is, it is a wonderful, wonderful tool in our hands you know, when we're dealing with this issue of mental health recovery. So essentially, what, what, what Beard did at Fountain House was he took this activity group therapy, which, is, which was basically a psychiatric intervention, and he secularized it for <clears throat> with, within a normal urban environment. We're down on 47th Street in New York. And said, how are we going to set this up with the purpose of supporting people and their recovery um, from mental illness? We call it a working community. That's the word we gave to it. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> Now, when you think about this in terms of what was going on around Fountain House during this period of time, 1948 to the present, well, <clears throat> during the 1960s, which is about 15 years after Fountain House started, you have deinstitutionalization starts to occur. There's a half a million people who are in the state mental, uh, state mental hospital system. Uh, most of whom by now are out of that system. I think there's about 75,000 people, something like that. And, um, and there was a, a change in understanding how we treat this issue of mental illness, that it, the hospital isn't the soul, or the asylum, it's really the asylum is not the approach we should take. People can live in society. And <clears throat> we, and, and a lot of the, uh, push for deinstitutionalization actually happened within a legal context around least restrictive environment. And we've gone to the, almost the opposite end of the extreme in terms of uh, least restrictive environment. However, think about this programmatically. <laughs> uh, does anybody know what the real percentage of employment is among people with severe mental illness? Ten percent, maybe fifteen, if you're really good. So, <clears throat> when we start looking at, uh, you know, the statistics, uh, do you know what the largest mental health institution? I live in Suffolk County in Comac, New York. The, there used to be three mental hospitals within distance of my house, within five miles. We were probably the largest mental health gathering place in the entire world. 
up until the 1950s. You had, uh, you know, um, uh, you had Kings Park, Deer Park, and and also Brentwood, and they were all. There must have been 30,000 people together, who were in these huge, massive uh, institutions. They're all empty now. They're all empty buildings now. So, <clears throat> but do you know what the largest mental health institution is now in Suffolk County? Prison. <laughs> so essentially, what we've done, what, what we've done is we've taken uh, and base, what is basically an illness, and we've criminalized it in terms of our institutional care. Uh, and uh, an NPR was doing this same thing in the sh Chicago, and I think it's the Cook County Jail is the largest institution for people with mental illness. So we, th this is our programmatic achievement uh, of deinstitutionalization. Uh, <clears throat> I just mention this because it's at the same time that Beard introduced this idea of, of uh, Fountain House and, and what we call the working community. Because it, it really created a place where if what we believe is the real issue facing us, when people leave mental institutions and they go into society, we believe the real issue is, so, is, <clears throat> is social isolation. Uh, to, uh, when, we, when we use the word community, by the way, we don't refer to it as a place. We refer to it as a system of relationships. <laughs> All right? So there are, uh, you know, people talk about, oh, you have to be in community and everything. That's nice, but you can be alone in community. <laughs> and if you talk to parents of families, uh, <clears throat> who have uh, somebody with mental illness, they're very aware of how, how their sons and daughters are isolated. They live in the bedroom. They have very few friends. Or, uh, so this issue of social isola I isolation, uh, isolation, sorry, um, <clears throat> we believe is the fundamental issue that, that we're trying to address. And that's why community is such an important word, an important model to really think about as part of a treatment methodology. Because essentially what community says is that, no, no, you don't have to isolate people or leave them isolated. You can actually have uh, people with mental illness can live in community. They can contribute to the community. They can have relations within the community. Uh, <clears throat> we also feel that it's not just a, a place of work where you go and you have tasks and everything where the, uh, <clears throat> that's sort of drained of all emotional contact. Fountain House is a highly relational place. <laughs> and the tasks that are there, which was the real problem when you go back to that initial story that I told you, when, when, and when the student went back to class, she didn't talk about modeling. She didn't talk about coaching. She didn't talk about uh, <clears throat> uh, consensus decision making. I mean, all the, ta all the real strategies that are employed in order to create a community that makes it uh, amenable for people in recovery from mental illness. She talked about the things they did. And that's what I meant about language, is that nobody saw what was really going on. And, th and that's why, that really why we wrote the book. We were trying to figure out, well, what do you really say to people? What's really going on here? Um, <clears throat> so, um, and just at, at Fountain House, and I'll, I'll do this rather quickly, we really believe there's a, a very, special way we set up this community. There are certain principles that we embed within this community. First, that which is represented here, I just don't speak, John speaks with me, we went to Portugal together, we're going to Switzerland together as well. This year we were invited back. <laughs> he, did, he was invited back, then he invited me to come with him. <laughs> All right, so John was the invitation, okay? So, <clears throat> so but that shows you that that we don't do things without members. Why? Because we feel that members are part of society. Members can do what, what, what I, I do. Members can do, we, we do it together. And that's the statement we're trying to make that, we, <clears throat> that, that people with mental, serious mental illness can live in society and be successful. <clears throat> there has to be choice at the base of it and freedom to choose. Um, and that we do this, and this is a collaborative, we are not a consumer-run organization, we are a collaborative organization. And we, from day one, we always think about that we do this as a collaborative model. <clears throat> um, we, we also have, um, I feel that there's a professional practice that's at, which is at the base of our work. 
in which we really divide up the uh, two functions of, of our work as a staff person or anybody, even members who are trying to help set up a clubhouse or a fountain house. There's a design aspect that has to be addressed. <clears throat> As I said, it's not just a place of work, it's a highly uh, uh, emotional and relational environment. And therefore, <clears throat> it, it demands certain skills, a very easy one to understand, if this is going to be a collaborative venture, let's do it through consensus decision making. So you ought to know how, if you're going to hire somebody at Fountain House, you ought to, they ought to know how to do consensus decision making. That's a strategy. Right? That modeling that you have to be willing to break up work and show how it's done, and, and, and the modeling. and There are other things, too, but that's examples of it. <clears throat> but we also believe that, as part of the collaboration, that there are personal relationships that we set up. And I love this, especially when you send students from here, or, or schools of social work, to Fountain House. And they say, well, uh, and this issue comes up about relationships and about um, <clears throat> Uh, you know, can, I, uh, can, can you see each other after work? That was one. Uh, do you give your telephone number out? All of which, in some schools, they're taught not to do that because you have to keep a professional distance, this idea of distance. What I say is this. We, we dismiss all those uh, prohibitions. Okay? That's not what we're into. What we believe is we try to get people as close as we can without touching. That is our understanding of distance. And you have to have a highly controlled environment to do that right. But we believe that that relationship that you set up is very important in the recovery process and, we have to, and you deal with that basically as a coach. You know, you're coaching people in terms of their own skills. Once again, it's strength-based. You're coaching in terms of skills. So it's things like that where, so these are all skills which I would, which I feel is called social practice. It's actually a word I got from a Danish researcher who was just observing what goes on in a clubhouse. It's a word that was used in the 1950s. Uh, at that time, it was called social treatment. <clears throat> And it was one of the founding principles of Fountain House that <clears throat> it was part of milieu therapy that was going on throughout the 40s, 30s, 40s, 50s in the, in the United States. And they talked about social treatment where people would just do ordinary, normal things, people who had mental illness, and that's how you would uh, support their recovery. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> so you would help in socializing, helping them to socialize in a normalized environment. Um, <clears throat> so um, in, in thinking about this word community uh, as a very powerful way of understanding um, how mental health practice should, or mental health agencies should be practicing, what we did is first of all align ourselves deeply within both psychiatry through activity group therapy, which goes back to group work of Freud, which, and it sort of splits between treatment, uh, treat, um, task groups and treatment groups, I guess is a way of doing it. And we took the task group route rather than the treatment group route, treatment group route, which would be uh, uh, <clears throat> more of um, uh, a talk therapy. But it had this sense, we come out of a very strong psychiatric uh, 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 <clears throat> milieu. We also come out of a very strong social work review, uh, milieu in terms of the settlement houses. Fountain House is a house like a settlement house. I mean, even our name, we were started by a settlement house on 46th Street who gave us the money to start. And so we have also these other roots that come from social work, strength-based, empowerment, all these, the language that we use <clears throat> um, and, and values that we espouse are very uh, central to work, in good work, what is considered exemplary work in social work. Um, <clears throat> and what we do actually is take something like strength-based or empowerment, say empowerment, and we actually figure out how to actualize that 
in reality. So for us, empowerment means we do consensus decision making. Empowerment means that we don't hire enough staff and that we always are working with, as a result, have to work with members in order for the work of the house to get done. So we take these values of empowerment and strength base, and we try to figure out very practical, everyday, mundane ways of doing this. Like, you know, we're together, we're gonna make sure all the flowers are done today, you know, <laughs> and they're fed properly and stuff like that. So, <clears throat> um, uh, <clears throat> and just in conclusion, I know one of the things that happens for me, when I go, especially if I'm dealing with policymakers, they, well, Fountainhead, that's sort of old thing. That's old style. <laughs> you know, cause, and we are old, okay? We're 65 years old, I guess. And, <clears throat> and um, so it's, it's a tough thing. It's a tough sell to be old, I guess. Uh, and, but I, I just simply say, uh, I just simply say, look, um, you know, we hold the same values as the recovery methodology, which is a very in way of you know, talking today, or the recovery methodology, that people can live and thrive in the community, that, <clears throat> that, uh, this is, that hope is, is, is central to a recovery theory, not chronicity that you're always gonna be saying. That choice and you know, nothing about us without us, these are all the mantras. And these are all, if, if you, you know, if you look at Fountain House and the history of Fountain, these are all things that we started with. These, this was sort of basic 101 Fountain House. Um, to that, we, we're not just a consumer society, okay? We are somebody, we actually ask members to contribute. That is our primary goal. As part of this contribution, we do help members with their needs, but we, people don't come to us to get a job, to get housing. When they come to us, they say, what would you like to do? We don't, I don't even say, what would you like to do? I say, hey, I need help. Can you help me today? <laughs> okay, I got to get this done, and you're the only one here. Can you just <laughs> follow me around? <laughs> See, he knows. <laughs> so we, we're into not a consumer society. We are into a contributing society. Once again, demonstrating that members can live just like everybody else, doing very important work in our society. That is helping their peers live, and not in the hospital anymore, not in the asylum, but within this new methodology that we believe very strongly in, that they can survive in. in a <clears throat> and we've practiced this since 1948. So do you have any questions? Yes. Actually, Andy, thank you so much. I'm sorry I was a few minutes late. Um, so as kind of an AGPP practitioner, and I was thinking about more um, systems level, more structural level, I'm wondering what Fountain House does or what, as a community, you do to increase that 10% employment outside of Fountain House or to generalize these kinds of principles so that, um, so that people who live in Fountain House have a more friendly environment outside of Fountain House as well. So I, I think uh, you're probably familiar with the transitional employment. I'm not going to go into that. Our latest venture, because we're looking at the stats and we're saying, well, we're not getting anywhere with just transitional employment and uh, supported employment, you know, the regular and full employment is sort of a troika, you know. So what we've really started to look at are social cooperatives where members actually become the owners as well as the workers within businesses. And um, <clears throat> we've been doing this for about... Uh, five, six years now. Um, and the more we do it, uh, this is not easy work. There's no easy answer here. Uh, but um, I personally believe very strongly that we have to go much further in doing this. The Europeans have, have moved in this area as well. And certainly, if we're going to work with people in India and in Africa, we, in the same way in New York City, you cannot conceive of, <clears throat> uh, not, if you're going to do social work, that you got to have housing. Otherwise, people freeze to death, right? So in New York City, we, we sort of got it that we have to do something about housing and homelessness. Not that everybody has housing, but at least we do something. Unlike LA, where because of the weather, they don't have to do anything, so they don't. And then people are just left on the street all over the place, OK? But if, yeah. So, I, when I say, well, if we're going to go to Africa 
and not have people chained to trees and all this other bizarre stuff that goes on, how people are really treated in the inhumane ways people are treated if they have schizophrenia, um, that we're going to have to go with jobs, figure out this jobs way of, and, and they're real jobs. And that's why we've started to explore this idea of social cooperatives that, first of all, it's, it's sort of interesting for members to say, well, you're the owner now. <laughs> And they can also control their time. See, if you're, if you're, if you're an employee, you can't control your time. You know, it's whatever the employer tells you is your time. But if you are the, the owner, you control your time. This is very important for our members because they can't work a certain amount of hours or they're going to lose their, their health insurance. They're going to lose their benefit, you know, the, 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 the Social Security benefits that they receive. So they can restrict their hours and still be the owner. <laughs> which I think is one of the real great benefits of thinking this way. We do it as a group. Cause, why? Because that's what we're good at. We're good at groups. That's, that is our technique that we, you know, and that's where we're moving for the future is to look at this. I have two follow-up questions. Sure. So one is I'd love to hear an example of that. And two is are there policy changes that need to happen to support more of that? Yeah, there'd be great policy change. Our first one, I'll start with the second question. We first had La Luna. We started a, 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 a it was a luncheonette, and it was for a housing, a public housing project in New York City. And we ran it, and it was called La Luna. Uh, it, 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 now, they were playing on a, a several ideas. First of all, it was called the Silver Moon or Half Moon. The name of the house the residence was called Half Moon, so they took Luna, but they were also playing on the word Luna for lunatics and stuff like that. So, so they took La Luna, which was sort of the moon, okay? <clears throat> and they worked for about a year and a half, and then the, and then the city canceled the contract. <laughs> and they, when we went to the city, they said, oh, we didn't know. Or, you know, it's like the city you know, could be supporting this type of intervention. They certainly had paid for it because we were doing a business which was helping out in, and, and then they pulled the rug under, out from underneath us. And, you know, also it was bad business planning because we only had one contract. So when that one contract went, we lost the business. So. But now we're, uh, we've, we got into the bed bug business for a while because that was a big thing here. You have to sort of think of things, a niche. Uh, and uh, to, be, to be honest with you, we, we're very, uh, um, Jim Mandenberg has been very good. He, he was a professor here. Uh, and he was very, he's done a lot of work in this area. And he, he has gotten and guiding us about, about how to go about doing this. You sort of need a niche area. We're unlike the Europeans. The Europeans, they believe that, uh, they sort of believe in employment. And therefore, they will make employment for people, and they would fund social cooperatives. The United States doesn't believe in employment. It, it, so, it, so you have to make it much more, yeah. It, it, they, from a social policy point of view, it's, it's a very different way of thinking. So we have to think of the hardest thing is trying to find the right niche to work in. And, and, and therefore, uh, you, for, as a policy piece, you do need social investors. And right now, Fountain House is a social investor. And we're trying to attract social and people who are, so, who are social investors have a long term, you know, like it's not three years and the demonstration project is a success. This, we need eight to 10 years to pull this stuff off. Uh, and I don't know if government is ready to invest this way, both because of work, you know, the, how we think about work, but I think that's the real policy, and it should be an advocacy issue. I don't know if I'm getting at, but I think that you need from a, it's not really a policy issue, but you need a social investor to keep it going. By the way, Fountain House does not pay anybody. We provide, and, uh, and we give loans that are paid back once the company starts to make money. Uh, so we, we've tried to stay as, as much as we can as a, you know, so that the, the company has to really be real and exist on its own and supply something the market needs. You need any social cooperatives, yeah. It's not like the staff doesn't get paid. The staff are only, there is, there, there is no staff on, 
within the cooperative, it's no, wholly no. owned. There is a gut, <laughs> but we will. You're saying you don't get paid. No, 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 no. They, the paid staff, there are paid staff, and even here, we're not a purist. We, we're sort of moving that there must be some sort of guidance from the staff, and we're trying to work that out so that, you know, some people are very purist about, oh, you can only have members together, and, and we're, I, we're, we're just trying to make things right and, and not go with any of these uh, ideological ways of going about doing something. And so we're really struggling with what should be the staff role. So there is a staff paid, paid staff role, but they are not part of the company. They are there as a, as, as a, on an advisory committee. There's an advisory committee, and they're on the advisory committee. Now they know, I mean, all the members that know the staff, so that it's not like this, this is an unknown quantity, and they work together in, in doing it. So. Does that answer your question? Well, about? That's interesting. What is the scope of maybe like this? I'm thinking maybe we should get some oh. all the staff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll stay afterwards. I just want to thank everyone for having us here today. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, Alan invited me to come here today personally, and and I, and I was asked like, what do I want to share as a consumer, as a member of Fountain House, as a person in recovery, and and um, I wasn't quite sure what I was going to say, but we'll see where it goes. So I mean, I I think like in terms of like recovery, I think we have to ask what it means for an individual, as facilitators in, in, in the social work field, what does it mean for you? You know, I mean, when you work with someone who may have a men mental illness, and either in talk therapy or in agency and stuff like that, and when you see, I mean, with your education and the methodologies, it's like, how do you define recovery? I mean, what do you see? Actually, I'm gonna ask someone. Uh, you're a student back there, and. So like you're a student, how would you, how would you define recovery? I mean, for let's say a mental health consumer, uh, access one, I mean, bipolar, schizoaffective, schizophrenia, like how would you? Um, well, I guess it's, it's personal. I guess it's pretty individual. It has been one of the things I've learned here in working with people, but um, however they define, you know, feeling healthier, feeling like um, they, whatever their condition is, isn't interfering with how they would like to lead their life. Um, they might feel like that's, that's a recovery piece for them, but I guess I don't have a job. No, it's fine. That's, I'm, I'm actually happy to hear that. Because I, I, I think, you know, at Fountain House, like, sometimes, because I was in talk therapy for many years, and it was helpful to a certain degree. And I realized sometimes in those, like, structured settings, like, you're there, and someone's there, and by virtue of being there, like, you feel like there's something wrong with you, or else you wouldn't be there. And you feel in a sense that you have to, like, there's an expectation of standard of what is normal. Like, okay, are you thinking a certain way? Are you acting a certain way? Are you speaking a certain way? And I'm here to try to help you act a certain way, speak a certain way, and think a certain way. And that can be very frustrating, or and maybe not as helpful. And as opposed to Fountain House, I, I, like, if you come to Fountain House, any one of you, you may have like a little difficulty like knowing who's the staff and who's the member, depending. I mean, some people, you know, struggle a little bit more, but sometimes that happens to, to people. You're not really sure. And and I think at Fountain House, when you come in the, as a member, coming through the doors, there's no definition of recovery. There's no one saying, well, okay, we this is what recovery looks like and this is what we want want to see from you. You're kind of like thrown into the mix of activity. Um, there's an inherent need to be needed, which is really important because, I mean, it's not so much in my background, but some of the young people that uh, in that unity group that was mentioned, you could see the, a lot of traumatic stress in their background growing up, like really like deep betrayals by primary caretakers, and the love emotion was really mixed with a lot of other chaotic things, and they just closed down, you know. And sometimes I think, you know, what are we dealing with? You know, brains aren't inherently broken or, or heart are severely wounded. Sometimes I ask myself. And, Sometimes I actually think the heart is the center of consciousness, spiritual consciousness, and the brain is just the limb. And these yeah. symptoms are just really gallant, aberrant coping mechanisms that we have to try to deal with some really difficult issues. So, and I think, you know, Ellen was really stressing like the relationships, how we're kind of like very close. And I think 
what you get is like a re-education of the heart at Fountain House. Um, Trust, I think, is, let's say between staff worker and member is much more easily readable, I think, than sometimes in psychotherapy because they're you. They're, they're not this figure that maybe, you know, it could be a very difficult time dealing with you. It's just like you. And there is a re education of the heart where you're needed, you're respected, you're acknowledged, you're accepted. Accepted. Even people who maybe are acting a little bit strange or, you know, you're just who you are. And somehow in that mix, it's, I know I'm not, I don't have no background in social, social work or psychology or anything like that, but somehow there's a magic in, in, that, in, that, in those relationships, I think, that I've formed. A real magic. Because, like, we think of a lot of recovery is like, you know, if some of the students like, had a break when they were 19, they're going back to school and getting a degree, or are they working? Uh, what type of work are they doing? Uh, you know. So we have like these societal standards, but sometimes it's just the capacity to freely give love and receive love, I think is my definition of recovery. And if you can do that, the work will be there and the school will be there. Because you'll have that, like a reintegration of the soul, you'll have the wholeness back. And I think Fountain House does a good job. We're not perfect, but we do, do a good job of that. Okay. Thank you. Well, actually, thank you very much for, um, thank Alan and John very much for giving us a different perspective of, of Fun House. And I, this is actually my pleasure to really work with the two of you <laughs> to contribute a little bit about my understanding of uh, Fountain House and uh, to think about it more from the social work perspective. Uh, let me bring the, my slides up. Um, so what I'm trying to do with my section here is really to think about, really to talk about sort of an inner work within Fountain House. And uh, so I think uh, uh, Ellen and John helped us really to understand what the model is about and what the thinking behind it, what, it, what the experiences is like in Fountain House. And I think very importantly is especially for social work uh, students and faculty uh, all together is really to understand or to think use Fountain House as, a, as an example to think about whether there are actually alternatives to what we usually talk about in terms of treatment therapy that we that can really for us to do to be really helpful for people with severe mental illness. Um, so I wanted actually to start uh, look back into the literature a little bit. You know, I'm a researcher, so. <laughs> um, not much, unfortunately, or surprisingly, about Fauna House. But one of the things that I found, oops, what is that? <laughs> All right, that doesn't matter. One of the things that's <laughs> interesting is it's long, you know, it has been long documented um, in terms of uh, Fauna House practices as a generalist practice. And uh, the way to describe um, staff member in Fauna House is really a generalist. And because they are doing a variety of programmatic areas, which is true, and I will tell you a lot about my experiences there as well. And then it uses information and knowledge from multiple disciplines, and it's work on multiple system levels simultaneously. Um, and just one thing I wanted to add on what Alan was talking about before and uh, mentioning about John Beer. And uh, his very first uh, experiences in the hospital, working a team and, and working on uh, a group activity therapy, was actually in his second year internship as a social worker stu student. So what an inspiration. <laughs> so think about, you know, students here might be the next John Beer um, in the years to come. So be creative and be yourself and think, think down your own feet. Um, and the other part about the research is actually a lot to figure out who are the staff members at Fountain House. And there are quite, I mean, a little bit more in studies being done there. And so some uh, go for, uh, some went for the, uh, like a personality route. So they actually kind of personality test and so it turned out, you know, um, flexibility, spontaneously, uh, spontaneously. And enthusiasm are important uh, to be uh, to be a, a staff member at Fountain House. 
Um, so it looks like it uh, pretty much needs to be an extrovert to be able to work at Fountain House, but not quite so. <laughs> I will tell you what I saw. Um, and uh, but the other part is really to have a very uh, optimistic attitude about a recovery. Uh, that would be t definitely helpful uh, to work in Fountain House, and to be able to uh, to also call, so, sort of um, uh, buy into the idea. Uh, uh, to be uh, about Fountain House, they will be very helpful uh, working in uh, in a clubhouse uh, environment. And uh, to and I think all in all, it's really uh, the conclusion from the research is it, there needs to be a match uh, between the personal style uh, and conviction and beliefs um, to be effective in a um, uh, clubhouse environment. And what about Clubhouse practices. It's even less information out there. <laughs> um, but there is one study, particular looking at what are the concepts that are related to building a sense of community. And those are four. There are four particular concepts that the researchers uh, like, like, uh, picked up. One is to really uh, sort of de develop uh, affiliation, a sense of affiliation and support for members. And the other one is to create uh, the shared experiences uh, with members in, in, in a clubhouse. And then also there are some characteristics of a uh, clubhouse organization that helps uh, uh, to make, the, make a sense of community that would include, uh, for example, uh, the flex flexibility of the structures. Um, and uh, schedules and so on and so forth. And there is a fourth concept is um, to really make the task and the roles functional, meaningful within the house. Uh, and that's, you know, I, um, that's, that's at least to, my, to the extent that I can search, uh, that's pretty much what it says about the practices. But there are actually a lot of early writings uh, about to dis try to describe what it looks like uh, in uh, to work in a clubhouse model, uh, or in actually I should I should attribute this to Fountain House because a lot of writing is actually about Fountain House, so, and some of the articles are actually from the newsletters uh, in Fountain House, so it's really describing this particular organization. And uh, these are some examples. One is to really describe it as more of an art than uh, a science. And I think uh, in that particular article, it also described a lot of uh, paradoxes that a uh, staff member has to face. Uh, that would include, uh, and let me find it. Do, do, do. Okay, include staffs ex exercising leadership in order to give it away. And that would include accepting help from members in order to support members. And that would include allowing themselves to be inspired and moved by members in order to do good work. So that's you know, more an artwork rather than science. And the other piece is about relationships and the work order day, uh, which is the way that people describe the work. They, I mean the the Day program, <laughs> quote unquote, day program is really uh, we call it uh, um, work order day, uh, and those are those two components are actually very much intertwined, and people develop relationship because of the way that uh, people structure work order day there, and the relationship is really rooted in that kind of form and that kind of mode of interaction. And a third piece I think also interesting uh, I wanted to highlight is to really to adapt a peer role. And that would require the staff members to reduce the hierarchical power structure. Uh, and, and I mean, uh, in a typical environment, the staff member or the prof professionals would be in a higher power sta uh, status. But here we require it to be even out. And to really try not to hide behind the self-protective distance from the members. And so that's another piece that I find very interesting. Okay, and uh, given there is such a 
limited literature out there uh, in comparison to this fantastic model. So that really gave me intrigued and I wanted to really learn more about it. And especially I think before in the introduction, I've been doing research about uh, direct practices in community mental health programs. And this is certainly a model that I, I definitely don't want to miss. Um, so I had a very a good fortune, uh, a lot of support and help uh, that I, uh, in last year I had this research idea and very uh, fortunately I uh, was able to really do it. And so my focus is really trying to go into the black box of Fountain House and trying to understand staff members' role and function and what kind of practice approaches and stra strategies they are, uh, they are trying to do. And also trying to identify you know, since literally saying there are some characteristics of, a, of an individual that would be helpful, let's see if that's, you know, what are, what are those? And also the uh, characteristics of this organization, uh, what, what is helpful for this to happen? Uh, so I started my study in um, uh, November last year, and uh, so it's uh, almost uh, five, five months and uh, almost six, six months now. And uh, my approach is doing uh, participant uh, observation, in-depth interviews, and archival reviews. Uh, and I actually just tell you last night, uh, and I can believe it. <laughs> so I actually have been uh, in Fountain House for 37 visits now, in 37 different days. And uh, I have uh, spent about uh, 228 hours so far. Uh, and then I had conducted 24 interviews with staff members, uh, seven interviews with uh, supervisors or unit leaders, and uh, 12 interviews with members. And, uh, and I think what I'm going to share today, because it's still ongoing, so those members are still counting. Um, so what I'm going to do today is not so much to describe the findings of the, the study, by really uh, drawing from the things that I uh, had uh, saw, I have seen and uh, experienced from a participant observation, because I was I, I was really fortunate in being able to become a volunteer to the uh, to found the house and was able to be part of the uh, the work order day, and uh, and in that way I'm able to experience as a newcomer to the house. Um, and I also was instructed as a, a volunteer to uh, mimic the staff members' roles. And so I was able to try some things uh, and had, uh, ha I wouldn't say exactly the same experiences, but I think close enough. Um, and so, but by the way, I really have to say I had a newfound uh, appreciation for students here because I really see this as my internship and I haven't done internship for years <laughs> to be able to. <laughs> I do work here at school and to go to the field, and on average, I actually go there one day or two days a week, and sometimes three days. Um, yeah, I had a newfound appreciation. So, and so here we go. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is uh, focusing on two areas, actually. One is the direct practice from the uh, staff members, and the other part is really about the organization and the programming. And in practice area, I'm trying, going to really highlight the professional use of self to develop a genuine relationship. And the other part is the practice on uh, community building. And program part, I will focus on uh, flexibility and openness, and also the intentionality of this organization. So, um, so the professional use of self. Um, what I realized is that uh, as we hear from the previous um, uh, uh, presentations, it is a lot of interactions between the staff and the members and in a very, very unique way. And so what I intended to do or to see there is to see how that really looks like. You know, we can read about it and uh, uh, as Alan gave an example where the internship, uh, the interns wouldn't be really couldn't really describe what's going on, so that's actually one of the areas that I'm trying to focus on and trying to sort of analyze what's going on there. So when, um, so there are, uh, the list here are the areas where the uh, staff members really need to use themselves as the tool. And one thing is to engage members. And how do we do this? Uh, and uh, so, 
um, when the staff try to use themselves to engage members, a lot of times they use their personal aspects of, um, well, for example, their personal interests. So they talked about sports. And some, some staff has a background in arts, uh, so they talk about arts, they talk about music. And so it's n not just to limit it to their professional role, so to speak. It's really to, you know, we are all people, we are all individuals and persons, we have our, our own life stories, we share that. And use that as a way to, to engage uh, members. And then the other part is really just be yourself. So John was talking about you are you feel like you are you are there as a person. Uh, you can be a, a, as genuine as a, a, or authentic you. That's the same uh, for staff members. You know, um, you know, someone can be loud, be loud. Uh, someone can be, someone can be a little bit shy, be shy. And uh, because of that, it really creates a whole mix of different kinds of um, receptors, <laughs> how do I describe it? And so any member coming with all different kinds of characteristics, backgrounds, they have someone to attach to. And that's the beauty of Fun and House. So it really encourages you to be yourself. And I was encouraged to be myself too. But not, this is not to say you sort of put aside all the you know, ethical consideration, no, and, and, and I think if anything, I think it actually puts individuals in an even higher ground. You have a much higher bar <laughs> to reach because you have to figure out what are you really to be a professional working with people with severe mental illness. And so this, so it really puts you on your toes all the time to figure out who you really are as a, as a, as a staff member there. And the, the other part is trying to reduce power differential. And I think from the two um, pre presenters before, we hear a lot about you know, t working side by side and uh, involve members. But what does it really take for you to do it? It takes, I think, for the staff members to be willing to be vulnerable. Uh, one way or one thing that happens a lot is that because um, in front of the house, it really is intentionally to be understaffed. So all the work you have to finish, and it is by default, it, it, it is really the a staff member's uh, uh, responsibility to finish the work. So what, what can we do? So, so, so the, the, what, the way that staff members needs to do is really to invite um, members to do that. Uh, and uh, so, and then, the vulnerability, the need of vulnerability is to, to be able to be okay with rejections. So, for example, like I, I was assigned uh, and, and once that to make the water uh, picture for lunch. And uh, it's uh, actually a sizable serving, actually. Usually we have oh, uh, about 100 meal, serve 100 meal uh, during the lunch time. So, um, usually people will prepare maybe 12, 18 water pictures and, you know, it, it doesn't work well if I just do it by myself. So I have to invite um, members to help me. So when I go there and I say, could you help me to make the pictures? And uh, maybe we'll say no. And I'm thinking, <laughs> what do you mean no? No, I mean, I didn't, oh, sorry, I didn't say that. <laughs> but, you know, honestly, it hurts. <laughs> But the thing is, you know, unless, I mean, this is really the opportunity for me to think about, okay, why the person is saying no to me. Uh, it hurts a little bit a few, for a few seconds. Uh, but, you know, it's, a, it's really an indication to me to say, you know, first of all, maybe I don't have enough a relationship with this individual. No, no, they have the full right to say no to me. Or maybe the way that I invite them is not quite right. Maybe I didn't explain what is involved in this work, how long it takes. And, uh, you know, I'm going to work with you. I didn't say that. Um, so it is a moment of reflection for the, for the staff members to think through what, you know, what that no really are talking about. 
And uh, it also is an environment that for the staff members to be very, not only reflective, but take the responsibility, to be responsible for the no. And not to put the blame on the member who say no to you, but to think of the way that you can do better. Um, so the willingness to take that vulnerability helps to create or, or to really um, uh, uphold um, members, um, you know, exercising of their uh, autonomy. They are free to say no. And this is for real, they are free to say no. And you ha we have to be able to support that by, by the, the willingness to be vulnerable in that way. And it's required all, all the way through the house. Um, and the other part that is, and I, it's very, certainly very, very true to me, is that I'm actually a very new person to the house. Everything I learned new was told by a member. So I, taught, I actually learned how to use commercial dishwasher. It was taught by a member. And I was helping out um, doing the, the, the green, greenhouse and, and, and I learned how to check the chemicals in the water and uh, know how to fix it. And it's a very meticulous process. It was taught by a member. And so for every staff member, and it's not just me and I was, the, I had the fortune to watch some, mem, uh, some staff members switch units. So the host of the worker is totally new to that person. I had the fortune to observe the staff, mem, uh, the staff member, even though he or she had been in the house for a while, but the tasks are new. So the person has to ask help from the member, ask members to show, show them how to do those work. And that gives people the opportunities to really um, give members especially to be the expert. And that way to reduce the power differential. Um, so that's actually a, a very, very interesting aspect of the work and it requires a lot of self-awareness from the staff members. And the other part is to model the management of relational boundaries, and before we're talking about this, is actually a very social uh, environment. And, uh, and I think it's very interesting to see how staff members um, sort of figure out how to uh, uh, identify the boundaries. Uh, and then now there's no books to hide behind. There's only minimum um, like uh, uh, boundary rules uh, that's, that, that's being spelled out. So, and the reason for that is also to really see members as co-workers. This is a working environment. This is a working community. So they are not patient. Uh, they are not clients. It's really they are, they are working with you and you have to figure out how you, I, I mean, how you decide that, that boundaries. And, uh, and they, that creates a lot of interesting dynamics, and it really puts the staff member on the spot a lot. And uh, when member wanted your phone number and how you're going to deal with it. And I, I, I saw very interesting examples where um, the staff members has, has to figure out, you know, how themselves really feel about it. So that you have to go to your, your own feelings. And believe it or not, it can be very complicated. It's about how you see your work role, how you see your personal preference, how you see the other person in front of you. And it's, it's all, the, all together uh, of all those assessments and uh, you know, deliberations that come to that answer and how you respond to the other person. And if there's something, you know, truth to be told, what I heard is a lot of awkward moments and how you are gonna manage that awkward moment, how you make it become a learning moment for both parties. And that's, that's the way that we, I mean, they require uh, staff to use themselves right there. And it also promotes positivity, which uh, what it means is that a lot of opportunities are in the house where the staff members can provide encouragement. And so I saw a lot of, uh, uh, examples of like in the meetings they go through or review like a, so there's usually two meetings in the house one in the morning sort of set out the day and one in the afternoon sort of review what's being done in the morning what needs to be done in the afternoon so especially in the afternoon meetings there's lots of like uh, um, 
praises to people who have finished uh, the, the tasks assigned to them. And it's a very public, uplifting experience to be there. And someone would say, so and so, you did a great job on that. Thank you for helping me doing that. Um, so, and then, you know, and someone would say, so and so, I cannot do this without you. And it's a very, very public praise of the person's contribution. And the other part, and which I think is actually very interesting, is the staff are giving opportunities to really make good use of humor. And <laughs> one particular example is that, uh, so uh, I was, one, I mean, um, uh, next to a, a staff member who, is, who was inviting a member to do some data entry with her. And the member literally takes like a second it's not very long, but it was long when you are waiting for a response. <laughs> and then just about the time that she and I thought that he might just reject. And he, he said, okay, I'll give it a try. <laughs> and uh, so it was sort of a heightened the, the tension right there. But the staff member used the opportunity to say something, sort of, you know, use some humor. And, and she said to him that, I'm glad that you can really take some time to think it carefully before you say yes. <laughs> so, uh, and then I see this, these kind of examples a lot in the house, that the, the good use of uh, um, humor is really a way to diffuse some tensions and take, take no, make no mistakes. It sounds like a very positive and energetic environment, but it's, it is also very stressful on the staff members' side, and also members maybe. Um, so it really takes the, 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 the staff member to be, to be able to know how to make a positive spin on things all the time. And, and finally, and it, it, it is about you know, developing individualized relationship. And I, what I found interesting is that um, this is an environment that encourage everybody to be as authentic as possible. Said. So people are actually saying you don't have to, you know, for members, members don't have to love every staff member, vice versa. So staff members don't, don't have to love every member. Uh, and, uh, and this really creates a, 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 a you know, healthy environment with good support uh, around everybody. And so, and it also allows to develop individualized relationships. So for some members, a staff member might think that they can really, um, you know, develop a, a more close re a social relationship and also even friendship. And for some members, uh, that perhaps they really are uh, sort of focusing on work relationship and have it very effective and, and work very effectively. And, and but for each individual, they are gonna have the opportunities to experience different kind of relationship in this community. And that provides the variety of experiences in this environment too. Okay, and the other part about community building uh, is the staff members actually has to have their attention on a lot of different things. And this is actually doing a disservice to sort of a dissect them into three, uh, three areas uh, because they are really intertwined. Um, but for the purpose of articulation, uh, I try to um, you know, sort of uh, sort them into social connections, work order day, and uh, individual needs. And so a staff member really has to simultaneously attend to all three areas altogether. So it takes a lot of ability or cap capacity to coordinate. And the other part is to facilitate community identity. And when they do that, it is really together with members who are already there to orient new staff members and new members in terms of what Funding House is about. And they do a lot through actually uh, before we have heard modeling, conversing, really just talk about what Fun House is about, uh, and trying to share experiences, uh, and trying to show, show what it's really like. And so in that way to fa uh, facilitate um, the, the development of a community identity. And trying to connect Funding House to outside communities. And uh, staff members, uh, and I actually, as a whole, I think, what I heard from staff members and other people in uh, Fun House is that 
um, there is a very clear idea that Fountain House is not one shop for all. Uh, it actually has a very strong linkage to outside communities for a lot of things, for education needs, for definitely for uh, transitional employment because the opportunities are out, definitely outside how that's what it's for. And also for a lot of times for individuals needs, for example, they, some individuals, some members do need therapy, they do need treatment. And uh, it is, uh, it's being encouraged that the members will seek out those uh, type of services and help outside of um, uh, Fountain House. And so Fountain House has a very clear position or situated within the larger community. Uh, and that's actually um, very important for staff members to recognize it and to be able to really good, use, make good use of the community resources as well and to orchestrate more moments to ensure flow of work, because those are three integrated areas. And so for um, the staff members, they really have to be able to make sure the flow goes. And I think one very quick uh, analogy is, it's like working in a restaurant. You have to make your consumer happy and comfortable, and you have to organize with other um, uh, waiters and waitresses just so that you know things are being covered, and you have to go back to the kitchen just to make sure that food is made exactly the way that you know people want. Uh, and this is actually not an analogy that I came up with. It's actually from the interview that staff members shared with me. And definitely teamwork uh, with uh, a staff member and other members. And in terms of organizations, uh, I actually very much am impressed about the flexibility and openness of Fountain House. And it really allows the diversity uh, in staff composition and task development. And uh, by diversity, I'm not saying really uh, about uh, demo demogra uh, demographic uh, uh, diversity. That is there too. But I'm saying more in terms of the characteristics that before I described, people can be loud, can be quiet, and can be extroverts, can, can be introverts, and can, and can bring in different kind of expertise, uh, hidden talents to the place, and it's no longer hidden, believe me. And that staff actually have opportunities to, do, to come up with programs that fits in their interests and talents too. Um, and then it also stimulates learning through more, uh, mutual observation. So everything is actually out in the open. What I, I think uh, very interesting about this place is that there is a very limited space that's behind the closed door. So every activities, interactions are out in the open. And I think that really, really f uh, facilitates uh, modeling and observation. And I personally also learn a lot about Fun house practices by just sitting there and watch. Uh, and so that's actually a very interesting aspect of this organization. And also all can contribute according to strengths. So like I described, staff members alike. And so I think there is, um, we have film directors uh, among members. We have you know, uh, a carpenter among staff members. And so everybody get the opportunity to showcase what they know and to share their their uh, assets to the community. And they really provide individualized care. What I mean is that, just like John was describing, recovery is very personal, and you described that too, very personalized. It, it really up to the person to decide what it means to, to recover. And uh, so what they consider a success is not necessarily like some programs that you have to be sober, you know, after this amount of, treatment. Um, it's really about, you know, last week I came to the house two day a week, two days a week, and this week I'm trying, I'm going to try three days. That's a success. And, uh, you know, in the past years, you know, I only come to the house, maybe I would try, I wanted to try just uh, uh, traditional employment uh, next month. That's a success. Um, and, you know, last, last year when I come here, I only work in this unit, I only know these five, uh, four or five people. And you know, I, I wanted to explore a little bit more. I want to go to another unit and to see you know, if I can make new friends. That's a success. And so it's, it's really a very, very individualized idea. And, uh, and, and, and 
that's the, the difference between where they were and what, where they are is a success, and, and that's the outcome that can, that actually, I think it's very hard to measure scientifically, but it is very meaningful qualitatively. Finally, intentionality. Um, it's, I, this is actually also something that I found very, very impressed uh, by the organization, is, is how a program idea can be so consistently reflected on the design of the program itself. Uh, so the idea is for the members to feel need to, to feel being needed, and so there is this infrastructure to have understaffed design, and so staff are encouraged to involve members just so they can make make things work. And then when it comes to evaluation, it's not about whether the job is done; it's about how the job is being done. So I. For example, I was asked to, you know, do, uh, you know, uh, the, we, uh, when I was in the unit there trying to get their uh, unit, uh, newsletter out. And uh, so the unit leader came, came to uh, like a check in with me. And she was not asking me that, well, for me, have you finished uh, or uh, finished all the, the, the envelopes and put in the newsletter in the envelopes? She came to ask me, how did you get your work done? And the, what she focused on is whether I did it by myself, which is totally wrong, or I did it with the involvement of members. Um, so in other words, it's so, and, and think of other places, and we all have these experiences where, you know, the mission of that organization may, may say that I re, we respect um, uh, clients. But then you see there are separate bathrooms for staff workers and then for a client. What does that really say? But I think we don't see, an, or I don't see that in, at Fountain House. Everything is very, very consistent and that has that in, integrity in it. And so I actually mm -hmm. like to think of Fountain House as an organization with a soul. And it's really an organism that every part of the, uh, the working fits very well, well together. And I think that really gives us a lot to think about and how we can improve our other environments. No, thank you. So I guess we are just gonna open for questions. I would like to say something. <laughs> so I love social work, but I haven't felt as good about being a social worker as I do now after listening to this. This <laughs> love <laughs> <laughs> made me feel really lovely. And I, I want to thank John for speaking in the middle mm -hmm. of these two because as I heard what you had to say, it, it really framed what, what Alan had said in a very, in a way that I could really feel it. And it set me up to thinking about what Pam Page was going to say because I'm not the biggest fan. She's like too small. Um, but it made me, it set me up for thinking about what she had to say um, in a way that I could hear it from my heart as well. Mm -hmm. And not only do I see how smart she is, but how happy doing this work is making her. Mm -hmm. And I thank you for putting my head in that place so that I could see that. about social work that you felt so good about? Oh, um, just because this is, this is the way I practice, the way I see social work. So it's nice to have it presented, that, okay. presented in that way, that the real work that we do and the way that we experience and talk about it every day is okay. You don't have to really have fancy words and that kind of stuff. But, but finding those words to really know the meaning of it is important. But I think as a, as a teacher, hearing it in this way it makes me understand how important it is for the students as they learn to put the words to what they're doing and what's meaningful to them. It just made me think about it. Mm -hmm. So I think it was, it was good to think the way you did about how putting words to things bring a meaning to something that we fully understand. Mm -hmm. That was just a wonderful three-way presentation. Yeah. Thank you so 
much. Um, I feel like I learned a lot, and I'm sorry it's been three years since you were here. <laughs> I want you all to come back soon. <laughs> <laughs> on the term clubhouse. Um, I, I, I'm mindful it's a term that was much more in general usage in an earlier period of the 20th century where, where people in high school would belong to clubs or people would go to clubs. Of their, the word club was very often used. And um, in contemporary, in the contemporary U.S. at any rate, um, I think the term clubhouse is most often used in sports, it, at least vis-a-vis -vis baseball, for example. Um, Especially in Europe also, clubs are oh, almost of course, soccer sports, clubs. soccer clubs. That's right, yeah. that's right. And though the authority relations in the sports clubhouse are not relevant to Fountain House, I mean, it, say, take baseball, uh, the coach, uh, the coach uh, is the boss. Right, and, and the players have to do what the boss says. Um, but forgetting that, viewing that as an exception, the contemporary baseball or soccer clubhouse is one, or club, is one in which um, teamwork is completely essential. And where people have a, a variety of different roles, each has to perform his or her role well, or the whole team can fall, lose, so to speak. And I'm just wondering if in talking to the world that doesn't relate so much to the term clubhouse in an emotional way as one might have in the 1920s or 30s, I think many people, men and women, might relate to the sports concept. Just a lot. I actually had to, in writing the book, it was a major issue yeah. um, because of the synonymous association between clubhouse and fountainhouse. People right. say we're both the same. Uh, the problem with that, as far as we're concerned, is that there's a lot of clubhouses out there that have nothing to do with what we're talking about. Absolutely. Uh, and so, um, we felt, and actually from, I, from a practice point of view, when I deal with new clubhouses, I encourage them to be very careful about using the word clubhouse because the people they go to associate for old fashioned uh, uh, people sitting around, you know, uh, playing games. And yes. Because that's what they saw in a, the clubhouse that they were associated with. Right. So, um, um, it, it, as a matter of fact, I, I, I do not find people who associate a clubhouse with athletic clubs and the discipline of a clubhouse. Yeah. They, the, from my, my experience, it's very undisciplined and therefore a, a very poor word mm -hmm. to use. And as a model, I'm not entirely, I think community is the, you know, task groups and then from a broader perspective, uh, community is, is the real model underneath it all. Because what we're really trying to get at is it's not work, just work and doing things together. It's how you do these things, the quality of the interrelation. I have to tell you, she, she's really onto something with this, uh, in the work of studying, instead of studying the members, she's studying the staff. And I remember the day that I had to give up my face mm -hmm. in order to survive there. And it was Esther who did it. You know, she sort of took me out and said, you know, you, you got to come clean with me. I mean, she really, <laughs> I had to pay for all her drinks. To, <laughs> but she really berated me. I kept saying, no, I don't do that. But I knew she was right. But it was very interesting, this idea of having a face. And I came from. You know, uh, BOCES, I don't know if people know mm -hmm. BOCES, where I had a face, I had a corner room, I had a door. <laughs> right. So people didn't have doors to their rooms, I had a door. You know, right. all this way, how professions create right. ability of faces so they don't really have to relate on an authentic point. Which is just what John is saying, what's really meaningful if I work with somebody, if they're authentic to me, I'm better. 
you know, and, and, and getting that across. And, uh, so, um, and, and club doesn't do it. So in the book, it, it's, it's, it's not mentioned at all. Interesting. In fact, one of the readers, I, I don't know, Columbia University Press put me through this gauntlet. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and, uh, and one of the readers was really uh, angry that to no end that I had not used the word clubhouse and some of that, you know, I was trying to be dishonest and everything. And, and I just said, well, I'm not doing it. I mean, I just said, well, yeah. I'm going to ignore this. But there is that sense out there that clubhouse is the word. And I just, I firmly believe it's not the word. It's the wrong word. It's associations are not disciplined clubhouses right. like European, right. you know, uh, right. soccer teams, right. but really uh, places that are hardly disciplined and do not show the, and, and really do not go after this idea of relationships. Right. That we have to establish relationships in, with people who have mental illness, because that's what they don't have. That's, what, that's what's lacking in just sending people out into society without support. And they end up isolated, even those who go to school. So um, I'm just going to, um, a quick comment, I guess, or pre and question. I want to thank you for your comment, because I also felt very, um, had long been a social worker. My very first job was in a state psychiatric hospital uh, during, right before I started, right before the institutionalization. So watch that whole process. Um, so, but, so what, and then I think about the evolution of the field since then, and one of the most remarkable things for me about this model, or if you call it, we we'll call it that, is that this, the capacity to sustain and evolve and, and maintain the integrity of this, what you call or, this organismic kind of whole, the whole, through almost a, you know, almost a century of evolution of policies and of um, prejudices and of programs and of professional education. And so there has to be something also, I think, that is at the, deeply at the kernel, which, um, which actually leads me to my question, which is about, because I now do a lot of uh, work internationally, I just actually came back from Moldova where um, they're, they are looking for, I gave them actually the citation to your book. Uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, but the point is, Thank you. There, of course, uh, that I'm curious how the, in, in moving the model to other parts of the world, how it's been, how it, how it is consciously or maybe even unconsciously adapted to different cultures, different contexts, different, and I get the European more maybe than the, or, you know, the Western model, maybe more than some of the other, um, some of the other regions of the world. So I just wonder if you could speak to. Well, the model was really picked up um, primarily through Scandinavia, and I have a, I have a feeling. I thought once thought it was religious because it was, you know, there's a dividing line, Protestant, Catholic, and they weren't. We weren't in Southern Europe, and we're in Northern Europe. But now I think it's really not religion; it's more language that we were so Amer uh, English based, and the Scandinavians joke in English. The Italians do not speak English. The Germans don't. French don't. All these groups are not. So I, I'm more of saying, OK, when you go into a European context, though it's sort of easy to do this. There's, there's social money. It's even there's more money socially than there is in the United right. States. And there's certain adaptations that have to occur. Um, now, it's gone to places like Japan, which has not been yeah. successful at replicating. It's very small. But South Korea has. Uh -huh. There's up, upwards of 20 to 25 clubhouses wow. in South Korea. And so, but I think that organizationally, South Korea did it right. So I, I, I don't know if there's time, you know, it might take us a little while to talk, but I think that there are certain areas, Finland, South Korea, Massachusetts, where organizationally it happened. So it wasn't the idea of the model, it was more how it was implemented that I think fostered its development. 
reality is we're not in Africa, we're not in South America, yeah. we only have one, two, three clubhouses in, in, in Argentina. So we're not in, in, in broad areas where, yeah. and there's, yeah. there's enough people, I mean, for this. So there's a real question about how it's been replicated, which I think is a really important question. And I believe because we focused on the idea, yeah. the idea is compelling, it doesn't matter where you go. The idea is fundamental that you need to be needed. That, you know, what, what, what John was saying. Guess, you just, you know, you need to be needed. And, and, yeah. that, and that was going to be the original title of the book, but <laughs> then we had an argument with the big one. So, but, so, but it, that's what's cross-cultural, you know. Yeah. And, and so we sort of took that and, well, we being the broad history of, of Fountain House and the people who invented Fountain House, sort of took that and tried to figure out, well, how do you do that? And so, and it over. But I think if you're going to talk about the spread of the model, I think you get into a whole different discussion. It's not just the idea is compelling, but you have to think about it organizationally and how how innovation. Then you really get into innovation, and I believe it's it's once again it goes back to it, um, how you organize groups with it, you know, yeah. and advocacy groups and things of that nature. That's interesting because I'm working in Kazakhstan, oh. and they're talking about all oh, these people in Moldova we could talk to and things like that. So.